Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast that gives you the tools you need to preach with confidence from the Hebrew Bible. I'm Tim McNinch, a PhD candidate at Emory University. And I'm Dr. Rachel Wren, Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary. The first reading for September 26, 2021, is a series of excerpts from chapters 7 and 9 of the book of Esther, which is fantastic because Esther is a great book, but is kind of too bad at the same time because this is the only time in the whole lectionary cycle that we get Esther read at all. So we wanted to take a deeper dive into this awesome little book. So we reached out to one of our colleagues for some additional expertise. That's right. We've invited Rosie Conditil to join us today. Rosie is a fellow PhD candidate in Hebrew Bible at Emory University and is in the process of writing a dissertation on the book of Esther, looking especially into the strange collision of humor and violence within this story. Now, since she's one of the brightest people we know and becoming a world expert on the book of Esther, we couldn't pass up the opportunity to chat with her about understanding and preaching from this book. So, Rosie Conditil, welcome to First Reading. Thank you all for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Oh, we're so glad to have you here. To start us off, you know, obviously, biblical scholarship and preaching, neither of those things happen in a vacuum. And there is so much going on right now around us, including a pandemic that has, you know, fundamentally changed life around the world for about a year and a half. So how have you managed pandemic life? Like just personally, what's been your coping strategy for the past 18 months? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm trying to avoid the news, you know, like the news cycle. The other thing is uh, that I had a a baby, my uh, first child uh, in March of 2020, just as the pandemic opened up. And so uh, it's a weird coping mechanism to have a a little life to be caring for. But she helps me, you know, kind of focus on the important things. And instead of, you know, kind of all the anxieties that are swarming around, she's a real, as you both know from your kids, our they focus you yes. in ways that like almost nothing else can. <laughs> they, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they care that nothing else is going on except what is happening in their little world, like, which can exactly. be really refreshing. And Rosie, biblical studies isn't your first career. Can you tell us a little bit about like how you found your way into this field? Yeah, I've taken a meandering path to say the least. (laughs) Um, So I started out actually in law and I was a practicing attorney in New York for uh, seven years before I took a sabbatical. Um, And during that sabbatical, I lived at a monastery and took spiritual direction for a while. And uh, it was actually from my experience at the monastery that I started uh, taking some theology classes and realizing that I really enjoyed scripture and started going in a totally different direction. So that's kind of how I got here in a, in a nutshell. Uh, my specialty in law was in criminal defense. I was a public defender in New York. So interesting intersections all the time with the biblical scriptures and my experience of practicing law in, mm-hmm. in the United States. Well, well, maybe every biblical scholar should start out as a lawyer because it's really worked well for the work that you're doing. Absolutely. <laughs> so, it's um, an expensive route. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Uh, Well, awesome. We are so excited to dig into this text with you. The lectionary this week gives us some of the climax of the story of Esther from chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 and 9 through 10, and then in chapter 9, verses 20 to 22. Rosie, uh, could you read that for us in English? And feel free to fill in some of those verses in the middle, too, if that helps. (laughs) Sure. So I am reading from the uh, New Revised Standard Version, um, and I'm starting here with Esther chapter 7, verse 1. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman off to the banquet that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, And if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people. That is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. 
If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Oswaras said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. And now I'll go to chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same month year by year as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. Wow, what, a, what an exciting climax to the story. Um, but before we go anywhere else, can we try to like just summarize the rest of the story? Like if you can, Rosie, could you try like the one minute, sen- like the elevator speech for the the book of Esther as far as just what's the plot of the story? Right. The story, I mean, can be summarized pretty quickly. It's got like a, a great kind of straight plot line um, and our reading kind of brings us right into the middle of things, right? So mm-hmm. the story begins in, set in Persia in the kind of opulent luxury of this King Ahasuerus, right? And the text begins kind of laying out the wonder and splendor of this kingdom. Um, and he opens with a feast that uh, he gets pretty drunk and happy at and <laughs> requests the appearance of Queen Vashti. Uh, and when she refuses to come at his command, uh, he decides to depose her. And that provides the opening for a beauty contest uh, in which all the beautiful young women of the kingdom of Persia are invited to compete, invited, yeah. uh, <laughs> dragged to compete. <laughs> Esther falls within this dragnet and uh, uh, wins the favor of the king and everyone who sees her, including all the eunuchs that are attending her. And somehow, you know, then gets elevated to Queen of Persia. In the meantime, another very powerful Haman, uh, vizier, or a courtier, or just a court advisor, uh, rises to power as well and gets into a quarrel with her cousin Mordecai, who refuses to bow or do honor to uh, Haman when he's raised to that position. So that's kind of happening in the background. Uh, and Haman manages to convince the king that the Jewish people, without actually saying that they're the Jewish people, mm-hmm. are a threat to the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so an edict is issued for the destruction of the Jewish people. Esther is informed by her cousin that if she doesn't do something about this, um, her people will be destroyed. Uh, and Esther decides to do something. And so she uh, goes against the law and decides that she will go to the king despite the consequences which she cites, which is death, if you appear before the king without his um, his exact command. Mm-hmm. So she kind of sets up these banquets, these scenes uh, that uh, she invites Haman to. And we're not really sure as the reader why uh, until this banquet scene that we get to in chapter seven, where that becomes revealed. And she reels in the king and Haman into this moment where she reveals who she really is, Mm -hmm. that she is, she's actually Jewish and she's been hiding her identity. 
um, and that this edict would include her and everyone in her family. And that is what sets the scene for what, what we begin here, the second banquet where she makes her large revelation. Mm. Well done. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, okay, so the ancient setting is in, in Persia. Do we have any idea um, where, when it was written or where it was written, if the, the place that it was set in is actually kind of the place it was written? Do we have any ideas about yeah, that? Yeah, so there, there's a lot of dispute, but one good thing about um, Esther in terms of we have some, some clear markers uh, where we, we might not always have in the biblical text um, that kind of give us some like potential endpoints and beginning points. So most scholars put uh, put this text somewhere between 400 BC and 200 BC, mm. and the reasons for that is because, as you said, the setting is in Persia, um, and it seems as though the author is pretty familiar with some details of Persia, uh, including some sort of internal details, like where the palace would be, how the administration mm. works, how eunuchs work. You know, so there's some there's there's that, and mm. so there's some sense that. You know, but in order for a reader to really be able to appreciate those details or that those would even matter, the, most scholars think it's got to have some crossover to about the end of the Persian Empire, which is taking place about 330 BC. Oh. Um, so, so that's kind of the reason for the maybe around 400, somewhere around there. And then the later point of uh, between 400 and 200 BC, that later point is there because we both have, we have the Septuagint, which is dated to oh. right around there, the Greek Esther, mm -hmm. which is canonical in some versions of the Bible. Mm -hmm. There are other also indications in the in the Hebrew. So one thing to note is that the Hebrew here is, is considered late biblical Hebrew mm -hmm. with connections to the Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of got that setting mm -hmm. in time. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Well, and then more broadly, too, the book of Esther itself has taken a particular role in, in Jewish history. Can you talk about that a little bit, about the role that Esther has played? Okay, so let's talk perhaps about Purim, if that's mm -hmm. if that's what mm -hmm. you mean, the festival itself, yeah. uh, and how that began, and whether or not Esther should be seen as an etiology, an explanation, really, for that festival. Because mm -hmm. the, the book as a whole reads as kind of the, the background for, you know, why do we celebrate Purim? And this is the story we read to remind ourselves of what, you know, what God, well, God's not mentioned in this text, yeah. but <laughs> yes, which is an important thing to note, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this, the survival of the Jewish people through this very serious threat, mm -hmm. um, the book itself has this sacred place in the, in the sort of festival scrolls, mm -hmm. uh, of which there are five, they're all read at particular festival points. Mm -hmm. And that's where Esther kind of for some people, that's the reason why it's here. Mm. There are other ways to talk about Jewish history here too, which you know maybe maybe I'll just kind of say a little bit about as well. The the fact that this is in a diaspora setting, right? And there there are other stories in the biblical text, including Daniel one through six, and and maybe you put Tobit in this one as well, the apocryphal book are these stories of Jews that are set outside of the homeland, yeah. and these books in particular address the kind of fears or even guidance on how to live in that mm -hmm. less rooted maybe circumstance without homeland. And, you know, you see some of the traces of that with language here as well and uh, how to navigate the complexity yeah. of, of not having power. No, I think that's, I think that's a really helpful thing to say. Um, it could even possibly be a preaching point. This, this concept of um, diaspora is where, the support that you've relied on and you've taken for granted your entire life is suspended and you have to live in sort of a different set of rules and a different, um, just a different scenario and figure out how to thrive in the midst of that, which I think 18 months into COVID is still, I mean, I think we're still kind of in a diaspora situation where the, the typical support, the typical rules have been suspended and we're, we're trying to find our way still trying to figure out how to thrive and not just survive in this place where it's, it's kind of like a, a foreign land. Almost. Yeah. And it's, it's also especially relevant for congregations and congregants who themselves are living in a diasporic situation as immigrants or refugees, yeah. um, you know, or, you know, first, second or third generation folks from, from other places that um, the particular sort of uh, cultural impact 
of a story like this really resonates with those communities and mm-hmm. it makes it the kind of story that you wish would come up more often than just yeah. this in the lectionary. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's exactly, I mean, that's one really great pitching point. It has always stood out to me about Esther is how she navigates that new reality and how she then, you know, chooses to, I, uh, reveal her identity, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. for I, I might self-identify as a child of immigrants, and so I'm an Indian American, um, and so I recognize some of the ways that she speaks, you know, to power, like kind of in this very deferential, kind of humble way, you know, yeah. and it cleverly kind of draws out on different ways to be able to gather favor to herself before actually asking for something, yeah. right? So um, there's a, a lot there for, I, I think, for immigrants to just recognize as well in their own life, the kind of code switching that's going on mm-hmm. as she, mm-hmm. you know, talks mm-hmm. to Mordecai in one way, but then, you know, in the court, you can see her her formality, the way that she's, if it pleases yeah. the king, you know, yeah. I want to make this request and this petition, right? There's a, there's a formality to her dress. She gets, uh, there's a very uh, involved sections of how she prepares for these banquets too, mm-hmm. is there's a, a lot for immigrants to self-reflect on their own, um, I don't know, the the struggle to belong and with which community to identify, right? So Mm -hmm. Esther faces a a struggle. Should she identify? And she has a choice, it looks like, not every immigrant does, whether to whether to make that alliance or not, to make that obvious. Yeah. Is she, you know, and and that yeah, I think about my queer brothers and sisters too, is like, you know, is that something uh that identity can put you in some danger uh in the church, right? Um but this story offers some, uh, you know, some mm. comfort in in the coming out uh, and the value of coming out, uh, of identifying yourself with a community that might be facing persecution, and in some way also advocating for them, right? So as the lawyer part of me mm. sees mm. the choice that she makes to stand with a marginalized, suffering community at that point and saying, I belong to this group, and I, mm. if you don't do something... I am going to die with them, right? And so she chooses at that point to identify herself and fall under the same, the the punishment that that edict would have included her at that point. Yeah, mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so so much stuff going on here like, <laughs> with, with just like... Dear, dear, um, dear listeners, you couldn't see it, but Tim just covered his face almost in despair of how are we going to get to all this fantastic things? Go ahead, sorry, Tim. No, it's great. I mean, the, the uh, theme of like, the way that she like passes for a non-Jew within the Persian power structure and then has to, you know, make a decision to uh, take on this public identity as a minoritized person. Um, And just all of the power dynamics and um, sexual exploitation that happens in this story. Mm -hmm. Um, There's the character of Vashti and and her sort of like, uh, badass <laughs> character in the story. There's just yeah. so much going on in this very, you know, relatively short book. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to bring up, Rosie, it, you, you made reference to this that, and, and this is getting a bit into the weeds, but there's a, uh, Hebrew tradition of this book. Mm-hmm. And there's also a Greek Septuagint tradition of the book. And they're not, they're not exactly the same. Uh, if there's one thing that people may have heard about of the book of Esther, it's that it's the one book in the Bible that doesn't mention God. And I think if I remember right, that's true in the Hebrew Masoretic tradition, but not necessarily in the Greek tradition. Oh. Well, what do you want to say about, about that? If there's anything that would be helpful, <laughs> oh, like I'm trying to put myself in the, in the place of a preacher preparing a sermon yeah. for this and wondering, does it matter to me that there are different traditions of this? Book? Yeah. I mean, I, I think one thing to recognize is the, the purposeful ambiguity of the presence of God in the Hebrew text, right? Mm. Uh, it's one reason why, uh, well, even there was a struggle to see the Hebrew Esther as part of this canon, yeah. right? Mm. So it obscures the presence of God in a way that I think uh, is powerful, particularly in the diaspora. And for if, if we think about people that are in the midst of struggle, uh, where it's a challenge sometimes to see 
God at work. Uh, and so this book really kind of speaks to uh, invisibility of God mm. um, and the question of human agency in, in the, under those circumstances. But as you said, the Greek fixes that problem. <laughs> uh, there's an, a, a, God is explicit in this Septuagint. By the time mm. it's translated into the Greek, what we find is that that community needed to have God explicit in, mm. in the, this narrative tradition, right? And includes also then the pie, because the question of, you know, how are Esther and Mordecai Jewish? You know, yeah. in what ways do they show any, you know, uh, loyalty? It's different from Daniel, right? Daniel is clearly, even the diaspora story, Daniel and his friends are, are, are oriented toward the homeland in a way that really kind of uh, exemplifies their loyalty to that primary place. Mm -hmm. Whereas for Esther, we don't, I mean, the homeland's not mentioned at all. It's not an option. Mm -hmm. um, it's, she's not oriented to where the whole homeland, she's oriented toward her people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really uh, kind of an interesting tension to work with as well as, you know, like uh, she doesn't, she doesn't have a place to run to. This is home. Uh, right. So, you know, for those, you know, DACA recipients or whatever, you know, like, you know, like there's no, there's no going back. Yeah. This is it, you know? Um, and so you have to, you have to find a way to get through, but the Septuagint at least, you know, uh, makes both Mordecai and Esther much more pious and devoted. Esther reflects on the difficulty of being Jewish in this setting of having to hide her identity, of having to sleep with a king that's foreign and uncircumcised, you know, so <laughs> all these like markers of Jewish identity become much clearer in the mm. Septuagint. Uh, which indicates to me that this is a point of tension is how do we define ourselves in diaspora? Yeah. Um, are we comfortable with this more maybe assimilated or ambiguous portrait that the Hebrew Esther uh, produces of, you know, the Jewish people that are both able to get along, uh, almost disappear, and yet still elicit a significant amount of hatred <clears throat> if the book is to be believed? Yeah. You know, so what is it that they're doing that makes them stand out in that way? Mm -hmm. And yet in the Greek that, you know, that is that is much more clear uh, mm -hmm. of, of where both Mordecai and Esther find tension in living uh, in in a foreign land among foreign people with unclean lips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so powerful. I just, I just feel like I'm just sort of soaking it in. I mean, every, everything from this idea of, you know, the, the purposeful invisibility of God. Can you say some more about that? Why do you think that God was kept at a distance or at an arm's length in this book? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think, uh, and for preachers too, it's worth really wrestling with this because I, I think a lot of congregants struggle with seeing God in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the way that Esther communicates, and it, it's a choice to see God at work. I mean, certainly the author gives you enough clues that, I mean, the circumstances seem yeah. to work out so well, right? And Esther uh, garners this approval and love wherever she goes. And it seems with very little effort, she's not doing anything mm -hmm. to gain that. And yeah. it seems as though God's grace and favor follow her in ways that, you know, that we can't really see clearly. And there's yeah. something really powerful about that. And I think many congregants might recognize that from their own lives is that there are, um, although I, I can't see God clearly in my daily circumstance, it's not like God has spoken to me as in other areas of the Hebrew Bible where we, you know, hear the voice of God yeah. uh, speaking to the hero. Yeah. We don't get that. We get a, a Mordecai who's also kind of a faltering figure in ways He's the one that challenges Esther. You've got to do something. Like, do you think you rose to this position, you know, out of nowhere? Yeah. And it seems to occur to Esther at that point, well, you know, maybe I maybe I do need to do something, yeah. you know, and, and that feels very uh, close to what a lot of people, you know, in real life go through, which is, you know, maybe I'm here for a reason yeah. and maybe there's something I'm supposed to do and, you know, I'm going to try. And that's exactly what Esther says. If I perish, I perish. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try. You know, and so there's something really powerful, I think, for people who mm -hmm. recognize in their own circumstance, they don't hear the clear voice of God to go do X, Y, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but in some way are struggling to figure out what can I do to honor 
you know, who I am, who I want to be, the people to whom I belong and love, you know, and want to see thrive and flourish. And so who is my community, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and how will, how will I do something to help, Mm -hmm. you know, whether or not God condemns me to death at that point, or, you know, or I just, you know, I fall victim to the law at this point, you know, like Mm -hmm. she makes a choice to stand and to try. Mm -hmm. The absence of God in this book could be sort of a scandalous thing, but in a way that's, that's what makes it so relatable Yeah, that that it's for, for most of us, this is our experience of God in the world as a kind of hidden presence that takes, you know, discernment to recognize. Yeah. Well, we're having such a great time talking about these, you know, like big picture things that are going on in this fascinating book. We should take a few minutes at least to talk about some of the particulars okay. of the lectionary text, you know, to give give people something to really work with exegetically uh, in this particular passage at the climax of the story. Yeah, I mean, let's dive in. There's there's so many things to talk about. First of all, I, I think that your your discussion of code switching and um, just in case we have any listeners that that's a new term for, could you define the term code switching before I ask my next question about the text? Uh, so I, I'll just use my own example as an Indian American, right? So with my family, I can use Malayalam, like our our home language or some mix of that in English. But when I am in my academic setting, I need to use a formal mm-hmm. kind of English uh, in, in order to be understood, in order to be respected, in order to be just kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a switch that's going on depending on who I'm with, um, in order to be able to communicate belonging in that group. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and that was kind of, that phenomenon is something that I'm referring to here in Esther as well, is that we see, um, not only in the way that this character navigates the different situations that she's in, um, but also in the linguistic, the mm-hmm. kind of, I don't know how much your preachers want to get into this, but there are Aramaic and Persian loan words that are in this text, which indicate that whoever this author is and the reading community is that they are also quite able to move between mm. cultures. So they can understand these Persian words. They can understand these Aramaic words. They can understand this Hebrew. And so this is a community that is multilingual, multicultural um, in in ways that, you, you know, just it's, it's hard to, you know, without more time to kind of really get into the impact of yeah. that at, reading through the Hebrew and seeing these Persian words coming up. Um, and it's very recognizable to an immigrant who will translate, yeah. you know, and, and sort of, I can, I can read, I can tell you something in Malayalam and then there'll be an English word in it, like, or Spanglish, yeah, for instance, right. it's like something mm-hmm. like that, yeah. you know, that's what you're kind of seeing in this text a little bit more. Well, and I think, I think that makes so much sense because as I was reading verses two and three, I, all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, they're, they're speaking in Hebrew poetry. It's A and then B and then what's mm-hmm. more A and what's more B. So the king starts yeah. it by, by talking about petition, it shall be granted, request, it shall be fulfilled. Like that is classic Hebrew parallelism. poetry. Yeah, it's parallelism. Yes. And Esther responds back. If I've won right. your favor, O king, and if it pleases, let my life be given to me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. She responds in parallelism. So is that an example right. of the code switching you're talking about? That is too. Yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, there's certain formalities that she's learned yeah. that this is how, this is how we communicate, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just powerful to me. I mean, in court, there's certain language that you have to use, right. you know, like, may it please the court, right. you know, that's not what you use in, in the normal world. But mm-hmm. if you are in court, you know, that's how you begin, yeah. you know, that's how, that's how you start or, you know, my client X, yeah. you know, that's in normal, <laughs> in a, in a normal world, you don't use that, those phrases. So it's, it's, to me, it's a signal of how well she navigates yeah. um, these very fraught situations. Well, and if I understand code switching correctly, too, it's the fact that if you use the wrong code in the wrong scenario, you will be rejected as well. So it's not just that you can communicate well, but that one code means belonging here, which would mean rejection over here. And if you think about that metaphorically for this book, too, like how did this book make it into the camera? Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> how did it communicate to its yeah. readers that it belonged? Yeah, you know, right. Like, it code switched to believers. <laughs> <laughs> it code switched to this community enough to prove that it belonged. Oh, I love that. You know, even though it it sits in challenge yeah. of many other portions of the Hebrew Bible, which is you know just amazing to me, the openness and yeah. and the closeness of this canon, yeah. like that it that it's here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're getting there bit by bit, and I think we just need to jump into it. And that's 
the violence in this book and especially in the sort of climactic moments uh, that, that we read for the lectionary text. So um, all the way sort of to the end of, of the part that we read in, in chapter seven, we're supposed to get to this point and celebrate like, yay, <laughs> Haman gets hung. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, that there's, there's something that, that feels just a little off kilter for that, especially like in yeah. preaching a text like this in church, <laughs> like uh, what do you make of this violence? And then just to, to tag on to that, as we get into chapter nine and the way that the story ends up playing, playing out that rather than like, rescinding the edict of mm -hmm. the destruction of the Jews. The king just piles on another one that says, when people come to kill you, you kill them. <laughs> and so there's this like big slaughter of those who were setting out to attack the Jews. Yeah. And this becomes the, you know, the, the impetus for the celebration, the annual celebration of Purim, uh, where the Jewish people would look back and say, this is when we got to kill all our enemies. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So all of that is set up like, <laughs> what do we do with this? And, and yeah. like, how could we preach this type of um, violent text? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, like I said, I'm writing a dissertation on this. So it's a, it's a huge topic on like, how is violence handled in this text and how do we celebrate it? Right. Um, and I think, you know, for preachers, at least to be thinking about, uh, the Hebrew Bible is full of violence, right? So let's mm -hmm. just put that yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. this is certainly not the only text uh, in which violence is related and celebrated. Um, w one thing to note here is the humor, right? So even as you're relating this story, uh, we're <laughs> laughing, right? And so <laughs> there is something joyful in this story about the, the death of 75,000, which is the number that's cited in chapter 8, verse 17, Whoa. right? Uh, yeah, right. Okay. So that number too, right. 75,000 should give anyone pause, which is like, uh, the COVID numbers are like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it just, it's, it's hard to stomach that number. Um, mm. and so, you know, lots of interpreters will say the way to go about that is to just recognize that this is exaggeration. This is fantasy. Mm. Um, and that there's a place maybe for revenge fantasy in this text. And we see this elsewhere in the Psalms as well with mm. the fantasy of being able to just slaughter your enemy and just have done with it, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, there's something to be said about acknowledging the human condition and, um, the sense that our own weakness and victimhood can lead us to uh, the same cycles of violence that brought us to those, that initial place. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, it, human experience tells us that victims of violence are often also perpetrators of violence mm -hmm. or abusers as well. For victims of sexual exploita exploitation, as you mentioned in this text, you know, I, I think Esther has something to say about that as well. It's like, how, how do we process trauma? And uh, Esther can be read as a response to deep trauma. So there's fear that's in this text of being eliminated, of being annihilated in the most awful way by neighbors by civilians, by shopkeepers. This is not an army. It's yeah. not the Persian army that they're afraid of. They're afraid of their neighbor turning against them and killing them. Mm. And so there's something in this text to me is very psychologically uh, provocative and truthful mm. um, about our own fears when unaddressed. Mm. Um, and so you know, if preachers want to talk about that and about how the cycles of violence often continue and get perpetrated in each generation. Mm. Uh, so one thing that I, I would suggest too, is that the rereading of, of Esther, the Purim festival offers an opportunity to reflect on the strategy of violence. Mm. Is this really what our, I mean, there is probably a natural inclination to, to want to avenge ourselves, you know, in these kinds of situations, but there are other options, you know? And so that's one thing that I think mm. the reenactment of Purim every year offers if a community can hear. And I, think they can because there are a number of folks who voice discomfort in the celebration of this text right so our communities are not blind to the to the mixed effect of a violent resolution right and we can see that even in our own protest movements today is you know there's there are there's always going to be a group that will say we violence needs to be at least on the table um and then there's another group that says nonviolence is the way of God, you know? And so that is in this text as well. Like there's a question here on whether or not, um, 
this is effective because obviously it it doesn't silence the threat to the Jews. Like they are threatened in each generation. That threat doesn't go away. Obviously they weren't able to eliminate all their enemies, (laughs) although this text talks about it. Um, It's a scene that repeats itself over and over and Mm -hmm. over again with every one of our wars. So, I I mean, to me, at least it's a, uh, the text offers an opportunity to host some of those hard questions for communities that are politically active, socially active, you know, what are the strategies that we choose to use? You know, what did they yield for us? How do they reflect our values? You know, and and what do we celebrate? I think that's a really like helpful hermeneutic strategy in general of, of, of approaching a text as a kind of conversation starter as something that can raise some issues that we, we have to think about carefully and, and work through together and then take, personal responsibility for our decisions about like yeah. that we can't just pass off our um you know our our own sense of moral responsibility onto the text yeah. like we have to evaluate this and it brings up these issues in in a way that um is really powerful because it is a sacred text yeah and so prayer is probably a pretty big aspect of that too you know praying on these these questions so it not only hosts these these scriptures not only host the questions they invite us into conversation with god about these questions too right yeah and especially there too is like is it god that um that licenses this violence that celebrates it with yeah. them or is the absence of god in some uh, necessary mm. for this kind of celebration on some way to say this is what happens when we take matters into our own hands wow. like there's a heap of 75,000 bodies and I, you know, I guess now an edict that says we can celebrate this every year. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, what's the what's the fruit of our actions at the end? Yeah. You know, so it might mm-hmm. be a celebration this year, but what happens a month from now? You know, what happens two months from mm-hmm. now? Like, so there's there's a, a lot here that the text can offer in terms of just you know um, providing the jumping off point mm-hmm. for some of these communities too that are struggling with. I mean, political polarization, yeah. now, every congregation that I know right now is having a hard time with words. Yeah. You know, how do we, how do we even talk to each other, mm-hmm. you know, before we resort to, you know, painting each other with this very broad brush of being an enemy, of being an absolute enemy, yeah. because that is part of what's necessary in this text. You cannot see the faces of these enemies. They're just enemies. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. It's not painted with any more detail. Haman is just, you know, we don't even know why. What's yeah. he, what's what's the animus? And that is ex- because there's never been a conversation. There's never been any, you know, detail. It's not, uh, you know, and that's something that maybe as congregation we need to think about too, is the resort to just calling someone a hated enemy, yeah. uh, precludes, you know, any curiosity about where that might've come from or what is it that gave offense? You know, mm-hmm. how do we, how do we live together as neighbors mm-hmm. like without mm-hmm. being at each yeah. other's throats? Wow. Absolutely. Those are those are such great prompts for conversation. And it's one of the things that, you know, even though we're hosting a preaching podcast, right, like it's one of the limitations of the sermon format that it it's mostly a one way, uh, you know, oration. And I hope that for those of you out there that are going to be picking up Esther and using it in your service, that you'll provide spaces for the kinds of conversations around mm-hmm. the issues that this that's that this book raises mm-hmm. for us to to work through and process through together. Mm-hmm. But you know, in the in the sermon context, one of the one of the sort of homiletical things that I do when I'm preaching from a difficult text like this is uh, especially when when the reading of the text is a part of the liturgy, which which I hope it is for all of you <laughs> out there. Um, I love to like read a text like this and then let it sit for a moment mm. and ask ask the congregation to reflect like yeah. as we were hearing the text where did you feel like celebratory where did you feel a little twinge of i don't know about that yeah. and can can our um sort of gut responses to the text also be an indicator of of where there are things to work through and evaluate and process mm. i think that's a good that's a good like sort of first way into helping people to wrestle with the text mm-hmm. especially in contexts where people are trained to just take the scripture as being like well since it's the word of god yeah. whatever it says i've just got to sort of like <laughs> 
swallow and slaughter my neighbor okay with. slaughter my neighbor <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so providing a prompt for a congregation to start to you know like let's ask those questions let's work through that together and then in the sermon you can begin that mm -hmm. but there really there needs to be more spaces than the sermon for mm -hmm. working through a text like this mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I would build on that. Not necessarily the preaching question, but well, it is still a preaching question because it's a preaching podcast. Um, but this idea of um, you know the festival of Purim. So that's if you're not familiar with it, preachers, it's P U R I M, the festival of Purim. You can look it up and kind of read a little bit more about it. Um, I would I would caution. I think the preaching pitfall that lends itself to this question of our Jewish siblings is. Um, not necessarily um, demonizing the festival that is lifted up in this book. We've talked about it, about how it's the festival of uh, remembrance of a slaughter. And um, if it is presented only in that way in your sermon, it's going to leave your people with this understanding of like, wow, Jews are really weird people who celebrate really weird things. And that's not, I think, where we want to lead our parishioners. So here's my thought. Let's say it's stronger than that. Don't, don't <laughs> do that. Definitely don't do that. Don't so, do that. So don't do that, A. And here's my thought, B. If you are going to talk about the festival, flesh it out before you do that. Give it an example of Purim. Give it a very fleshed out understanding of the modern festival of Purim. And then talk about how it relates to this book. If you're not going to give that space or time to do that, I would touch lightly on the festival aspect, because if so, you could accidentally lead people into a um, misunderstanding of our Jewish siblings that we definitely don't want them to have. Well, and I think that leads, you know, into just sort of specifically preaching the text. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about the big questions of what to do, what not to do. But did any angles come up for both of you, either of you, on, on how one might preach this text? I mean, I was really struck by... Um the theme of identity in, in the story. And as it plays out, especially in Esther's own sort of journey through the text for me as a, as a white male person, what struck me was the decision that Esther had to make about whether to uh, pass along with the powerful and uh, remain silent or whether to really take on a role of solidarity uh, with with her people and the plight that they were facing. Mm -hmm. And for me as a, a white male person, somebody with privilege in our society, it's not so much about um, showing solidarity with my people as much as it is about uh, allyship with uh, minoritized communities or communities that are on the margins. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, it's a little bit of a leap, but I think there's a, a way to preach a text like this if your congregation is a majority congregation. What's the choice that we make? Do we make the choice to remain silent in the presence of the injustices that are happening mm -hmm. in our world? Mm -hmm. Or do we decide, um, following the example of Esther, mm -hmm. to uh, take on the role of allyship um, even though that's going to involve risk for us. Uh, that's that's the beginning of a thought that I think could spin out into a helpful sermon for folks that are in a, a privileged context. I think there's, a, there's another angle that would spin that out in a different way if your congregation is among the marginalized mm. or minoritized. Um, but that's, that's where it hit me um, from my own context. Mm. What about you guys? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the identity issue always stands out to me just because there are, I think, rarely t texts that offer the opportunity to really talk about multiple identities mm -hmm. and multiple belongings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, f I, that seems to me a really, uh, really important thing to talk about, um, in terms of also recognizing our interrelatedness to one another and, the intersections that um, Esther occupies as both a queen, so somebody who is elite and powerful, but also someone who, you know, you know, has multiple belongings as someone who's a woman, someone who's been sexually exploited, mm -hmm. someone who is Jewish, you know, someone who has been orphaned, you know, so she suffers multiple um, levels to me of, of identities that could be considered, you know, you know, 
difficult challenges to live through. Um, and then, you know, also enjoys the, um, the privileges of, of being queen, of, you know, of having her own servants, uh, you know, of having some of her immediate needs taken care of, you know, very, very quickly um, and the favor of the king. So, you know, just to, to recognize that our own identities are intersectional, that seems like, you know, how, how rare is it that we can find a text mm. in which we can offer our congregations ways to reflect on both power and powerlessness in our own lives and ways that we've experienced um, oppressions and ways that we have oppressed yeah. others. You know, yes. this text allows the multiplicity of both confessing our um, involvement in violence and uh, victimizing others, and then also accepting that we have also experienced pain mm. and victimhood as well in different ways. And, and to be with that, mm. Uh, is a powerful preaching point for me. And Esther has always provided a way for me to be in touch with both sides mm -hmm. of that in my own life. You know, I, I have, I have areas of privilege in which, you know, I, I work mm -hmm. in and I, they need to be also consciously brought to mind to only occupy the place of victim, you know, is, is diminishing of who mm -hmm. I am. Um, and so that's, you know, that's important as we think about the complexities of how we navigate relationship, because that's ultimately what we're in church for, why we're listening to a sermon, right? Mm -hmm. We're, we're here to be in relationship with one another and with a, a divine presence, mm -hmm. you know, so however we understand that and to embrace identity too hard, I think precludes some mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, I have I have uh, fifteen things that I wrote down for sermon angles, so I won't say all of them. Um, okay, a couple things to throw out there. First, I I love this idea of the purposeful invisibility of God in the Book of Esther. I think that's powerful. I think that um, you choose to experience the voice of God, even if that voice comes through community or through silence. There is no guarantee that it's God. There's no proof. And yet you choose to continue to operate in that sphere. Um, I just think that's a beautiful, beautiful um, invitation to parishioners who might be longing for that, but be afraid of feeling silly about it or feeling, you know, um, uh, insecure about, well, how do you how do you act that way when it's easier just to come to church and then leave? So introducing that concept and that that courage of choosing to see God at work, I think, even if God is invisible, um, is really powerful. And then I just love this idea of, of hosting the questions about violence and about words and about relationship and using your sermon to do that. So I come from a Lutheran tradition, which is, you know, sermons are proclamation and you're supposed to preach and you're supposed to proclaim the gospel. And that is what you are supposed to do full stop in many Lutheran circles. And that's typically how I preach. But on this one, man, I would sit in the questions. If you're going to take that route, just lean into it. How do we live together as neighbors? Leave your people with questions. That that might be a different kind of proclamation than you're used to doing if you're Lutheran and you're listening to this. But I think it could be really powerful. And I think Esther, as a book, refuses to answer many questions. And this week, a faithful sermon on Esther might also refuse to answer some of those questions. So that's just kind of where I'm leaning. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. that because I think the questions too, uh, you know, ask for us to grow up. Yeah. You know, it's there's a way that I come to church and, uh, you know, I might hope that my pastor tells me what to do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you're right. Esther refuses to give you clear direction yeah. on what to do. Uh, and there, and that is an important part of being an adult. Of right. Faith, you know, um, right. Cause so often God refuses to do the same thing. God refuses to give super clear divine instructions on where you're supposed to go left or right. So, right. And if you're mm -hmm. expecting that too, that, that, you know, that the direction will always be clear, you, you will be paralyzed. Yeah. I think uh, at least that's been my experience yeah. is if I want that clear, uh, should I do this? Should I do that? From God, it, it often comes in much more subtle ways, and Esther is clearly a reflection of that as well. Mm -hmm. Is that there are there are, and there are times when you must do something, or someone gets yeah. hurt, you know. And so there is that's that there's a you know real crucible yeah. here for Esther. It's like um, somebody's somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's so good. I, I'm so glad to be having this conversation with you guys. I'm learning so much uh, from listening to you. And Rosie, you've brought such, such a, a helpful perspective on this book. It has been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you for having me. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Well, folks, if you liked what you heard this week, there is plenty more over at our website, firstreadingpodcast.com. We also post each episode on Facebook Weekly, which gives you an easy way to share your favorite episodes with your friends, family, and grandma or preaching networks. If you have found First Reading helpful, please do take a minute to spread the word. Many thanks to Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University for a grant that helps us sustain the podcast. Thanks also to Blue Dot Sessions for the music behind the reading. And thanks to you for listening. Until next time. I'm Dr. Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McPinch. Have a great week.